Yes, today we are very privileged to be joined by two special guests. Sega's greatest dynamic duo since Sonic and Tails. It's Tom <laughs> Kalinske and Al Nielsen. Guys, how are you doing? Thank you so much for coming back. How's the world? Doing, doing great. Good to join you. Happy to be back with you. And, and we... hi, Tom. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, okay. it's, it's, uh, it's great to have you both on together again. You know, I say the fact that we'd spoke previously um, during the kind of early days of the podcast as well. So it's uh, it's great to have you on together and to actually speak kind of face to face, albeit through the, the joy of webcams. But no, thanks very much for coming back on again, guys. Our pleasure. My here. pleasure, at least. <laughs> Our pleasure, Tom. I'll join you there. <laughs> So it's like that you both speak. A duo after yeah, all. You are the greatest <laughs> Sega Dynamic duo since Sonic. Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> I take it you both speak fairly regularly, or you've been friends for a, a long time. Um, can you tell us how you first met? I mean, it was pretty Sega, wasn't it? Uh, we oh, know yes. each other from Mattel. And when Tom was president of Mattel, and uh, I had joined Mattel Electronics. So that's when I uh, got to meet him. So that was back in the uh, early 80s. Yep. Jeez. 82. Actually, I met you when I was at JCPenney a few years ago. Oh, that's true, so too. That was in the 70s. Been, <laughs> so that would have been, no, that would have been, well, no, that would have been about 1980, 81 is when I first 81. met you. 81, yeah. yeah. And then the first probably. time I worked with you was at Mattel. And now we're doing podcasts together. Yeah. How we have, it, how we have gone and lived our life <laughs> and we we tend to communicate fairly regularly I, I in fact i communicated with al yesterday or day before an old friend stefano arnold who used to run tech toys in uh, brazil Jeez. and handled sega mm -hmm. and still and, and i and he sold tech toy to another company but they're still selling the the master system down right. <laughs> yeah still doing still doing well so it was good to see stefano two days ago Oh, it's, it's wonderful, all of the friends that we've gotten globally uh, through Sega. And uh, today we learned that one of the product managers who worked for me, who went to Mattel and helped start their software division, one of her products just got nominated for the Video Game Hall of Fame at the Strong Toy Museum. Uh, oh. Barbie, fashion designer, fabulous product. Uh, I the funny story about that, I'm on the board of the Strong Museum, so I didn't have anything to do with this nomination, but I am going to tell everybody this story. That one CES long, long ago, uh, I was speaking on a panel, and uh, after I spoke, they were starting to ask questions, and somebody said, well, what's going to be the best-selling software title this year? And I said, well, it's going to be the Barbie Fashion Designer. And everybody booed and hooted. They didn't think that was possible. How could it outsell all of the great other game uh, titles? Turned out it did. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it just shows that there's always room for innovation in the video game business because, you know, it always had been design a uh, clothes for Barbie. But not only with the Barbie fashion designer could you go and design clothes, but then they had special fabric paper that you could put in your printer, print out the clothes and cut it out or whatever it was and put it yeah. together. And you've got right. clothing for Barbie and just a phenomenal concept, executed beautifully, marketed wonderfully by Pamela Kelly uh, and enough promoting that. Yeah, so, it got it got a lot of girls doing uh, doing that for you know in, involved in the video game industry you know, in a strange sort of way. Yeah. Certainly have saved me a lot of money anyway. The amount of Barbie clothes I've had to buy for my daughter recently, I'm telling you. Oh, I think I think my my daughter would have used so much fabric paper that that we would have lost anything anything any any, any benefit we would have got. Well, I've not heard of it. So that's amazing. I don't know. I don't know if we got it over here. But it was that sounds incredible. It's something my daughter would definitely love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, likewise. No, I mean Al, you'd mentioned in our previous chat, you know, that the Genesis was launched by four guys in a back office of a Sega repair shop. Back then, did you ever think that it would reach the heights that it did? I mean, you, you said they're kind of 
you know, you met in this kind of early 80s yourself and Tom, and now you're sitting doing podcasts. I mean, back then, you know, could you ever have imagined that you would have that kind of longevity going forward? Um, it's, it's, no. <laughs> it, it was, <laughs> we, we knew that it was going to go and do well. Um, you know, but there was this big behemoth uh, that had two plumbers named Mario and something. Um, mm. And so, you know, they were going to be coming out later with their 16-bit system. Uh, and so we just wanted to go and get a good toehold and see um, how well we could go and do and create a good software business for it. Um, and then Tom came on board and um, we got started getting even more great software that's in. And then a little hedgehog, a blue hedgehog of all things, <laughs> came into our lives and uh, the rest is history. But uh, I think what is kind of the pinch me moment is, you know, some 30 years later, um, we're here talking with you about it. And uh, there's this giant retro craze around, um, you know, older video consoles around the Genesis slash Mega Drive in particular. Um, and, and that's the thing that just kind of like, wow, that's, a, that's kind of a wow moment for us. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's that is what's something surprising. we never could imagine. That's what surprises me is how long this interest in this period of time when Al and I were involved, uh, the interest is just incredible to me. And it literally every week I get either emails or snail mail or something from somebody who wants to talk about that period or they send me a cover of a game and say, will you sign this and send it back to me? I mean, crazy stuff like that. And it's literally every single week a new person gets hold of me and wants to talk or, or communicate in some way about that period of time. I mean, uh, and it's not just us, it's the entire team. And, you know, we talk to our colleagues and um, they're both amazed, but also very happy that you know, the work that we did uh, with these great products, people want to hear about. So thank you all. Yep. Yeah, thanks again. Oh, no, thank, thank you. The pleasure is all ours. I mean, it blows my mind that Microsoft have been making video game consoles now for longer than Sega ever did. Uh, and yet it doesn't feel like that they've had an imprint like the period that you guys oversaw. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it so special. And that's what captures so many of, of our hearts and Sega fans all over the world. So it really is just that whole period. It's just, it's just magical. So, I mean, the story is phenomenal. When you think about it, you came in, as you say, in our, this company with two plumbers, Nintendo was an absolute Titan at the time. And uh, I think your first tactic was really to, target a different demographic wasn't it and take gaming take gaming mainstream which again is something that really still resonates today so you had the celebrity endorsements for genesis that genesis does and that was all pretty successful at the time w wouldn't you say so I, yeah. you know i think what we did is we transformed what the video game industry is from being uh, a to a certain extent a toy or uh, a kid's product and into a product where it was for all ages. Um, you know, Tom uh, helped lead us into the college market, uh, which was very important. Young adults, people who had uh, started in the arcades, started with Atari VCSs and put them aside, and now they've grown up, and now they want to keep playing video games. And um, so they chose a Genesis slash Mega yeah. Drive. It, it, that's what I'm most pleased about is to see how the efforts we started have continued. And today, as you guys know, the video game industry is larger than the movie mm -hmm. and music industries combined. Two times the, larger than the music and, and movie industry combined. 250 some billion this year, and they're saying 400 billion next year. I mean, it's, it's just uh, incredible that all ages are playing video games, and it is the form of entertainment now uh, in most of the world, uh, except for the places they don't allow it to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, and Tom, I remember you pre uh, approaching the uh, music or the movie industry 
movie industry uh, rating bodies because we wanted <laughs> to go and use their ratings. And uh, you know, that's a funny. That's another funny story. I don't know if you know the name Jack Valenti. Jack was head of the motion picture rating society system and in the movie industry. He was head of the president of the movie industry. And he was a famous lobbyist as well in Washington, D.C. And so when we decided we wanted to go after older ages, that meant we were going to do games that weren't just, you know, G-rated. We had to do PG-rated and, uh, and R-rated, and we were, going to, we were going to expand the market. And so I went to Jack, and I said, you know, we're going to do, uh, we're going to rate our video games, but why, can, why don't we just use the rating system you guys have established because everybody's familiar with it and they know the terms. And moms would appreciate that, and dads. And he said, what, the video game industry? <laughs> We're a tiny little business. Why would I want to use my wonderful <laughs> system for video games? Get out of here, basically. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so, of course, we did our, our own thing with the originally the Interactive Digital Software Association, the ESRB, and now they've, they've changed it a little bit to the Software Association. But anyway... Uh, the Entertainment Software Assist Association. Uh, anyway, a few years after we were really growing and the thing was really taking off, and maybe we weren't yet quite as big as the movie industry, but we were pretty darn big as an industry, I ran into Jack in an airport and I said, aren't you sorry you now you didn't let us use your rating system? <laughs> he <just> walked away. <laughs> uh, if only in you, eh? if only in you. Yeah, you know, and and, and you know, the other thing I think that I, I we're very proud of is having a rating system for the video game business. Uh, you know, it was something important to help parents understand what kinds of video games they were buying and give them some guidance. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you know uh, we started on our own, and now it's become an industry standard. Uh. Um, so it's it's a major. Um, accomplishment that we did way back then. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all part of, you know, setting the stage for the industry to go and grow and grow and grow uh, and expanding the um, type groups of people who wanted to play video games and are playing video mm -hmm. games. Uh, the, the crazy part and, about that was way back when uh, we were doing the congressional hearings or the Senate hearings, I, before that started, I went back to Washington and I met with a, a huge number of the senators, kind of up and down the halls of the Senate. And uh, and it was amazing to me that even our own California senators, Boxer at the time and Feinstein, did not understand that the video game business was not just little kids. Mm -hmm. And I remember them saying to me, well, what, what do you need a rating system for? You should just do titles that are of course, just G-rated for kids. I said, well, they're, because we're going after an older audience, adult audience. And they couldn't believe that adults and 18-year-olds uh, and 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds would be playing video games. They thought it was completely a kid's business. And unfortunately, I think that view still prevails to some degree in, uh, in government offices. They just don't understand this phenomenon that has been created. Even in society in general, I think, Tom, as well, it can exist. I mean, I think my wife still works at the fact that I'm 43 years old and still play video games, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I'll, just, I'll just show this after, like, this man's responsible, right? So, <laughs> so I mean, the, the thing with the rating system as well, Al, whenever you're talking about, you know, the, it's still amazing that the job that you guys did to establish that, but... Obviously, Mortal Kombat was a kind of big part of it, but for the first time, thanks to the, the Mega Drive or the Genesis Mini 2, I got to play Night Trap for the first time recently. And looking back, I can't believe that that game caused all this <laughs> this absolute <laughs> chaos. That, I mean, the, the fact that, it's, that you're not actually trying to harm anybody, you're actually, you know, trying to save people. And then these guys come in and they've got these things that they... they, they go. <laughs> <laughs> Just happen to have. <laughs> it's on the there switch. It is. The, the, the most, the most child-friendly uh, platform you could imagine that it's on there. <laughs> well, I don't think you guys know that I was involved with Night Trap because Night Trap was developed as a piece of software for a video game console that we were working on at Hasbro. 
um, and in a division called Hasbro Electronics. And I was heading up marketing for that. And it was live action, full motion video um, that you were able to go and get on a video console along with your VCR. And Night Trap was one of the titles that we were doing. Uh, and there was, we were concerned. So we went and we did some focus groups where we went and brought uh, kids and their parents in, put the kids in one room, put parents in the other room, had them both play the game, see what was there. And then we would talk to them about it. And the funny thing was the parents were going, oh, this is okay. Yeah, I'd let my kids go and do this. When the kids are going, oh, well, my mom and dad, let me go and do this, you know. And But the parents were just so happy to do it. And then we brought the parents and kids together. And it was like, yeah, you can go and buy this. I have no problem with you going and playing this game. Um, and then fast forward um, 10 years, I guess, when um, that and Sewer Shark and the other titles that we were doing uh, were coming out for the Sega CD, um, was all of this concern. Um, yeah. and I think a lot of it was, you know, some people believed it, but I think it was also a lot of fake concern. We, you know, oh, that's bad. That's bad. Um, yeah. and I think that there were maybe other companies that didn't want us to go and, and succeed. Well, um, well, remember Howard Lincoln said, Night Trap would never be on a Nintendo system. <laughs> the package I just showed you is Night Trap on the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should ask him if he'd autograph that for you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, drop, drop, <laughs> drop him an email and ask him see if he wants to eat the autograph. That. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's just so interesting. The you know what well, the, I, the I got, industry has been through. One of the morning talk shows interviewed me about Night Trap, and I didn't realize it. Be, behind me, they were showing the scenes. Love Night Trap on a large screen television. And the the morning uh, newscaster was saying, well, you really think this is okay for kids to play? And it's showing one of those scenes where the monsters are grabbing a gal that's in a nighty and hauling her away. And and I didn't know that was going on. And I, so I was trying to defend the title and talking about how it really, really did it as kind of a, a B-rated, uh, uh, mm -hmm. almost funny kind of video game. You know, it was, there was a lot of humor in it. They didn't get it at all. They were they were trying to crucify me on that. I mean, it's just guys. I still have one of the trocars. Yeah, I still have one of the trocars, which was the thing that they went and to go and get and put around the people's heads. And <laughs> That's get what it was. I still <laughs> have that in, in one of my closets. Uh, the other thing is when we introduced Sega CD in Times Square, we had things up on the jumbotron in Times Square. So not only did I get to play Sonic up on the Jumbotron, I got to play Night Trap up on the Jumbotron. <laughs> uh, not too, I'm not too sure too many people know about that, but yeah. Uh, the biggest scene ever. The envy of, of kids all over the country with that, you know, this giant TV playing Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just great. We were, we were in a building, we were in the Marriott Marquis about three blocks away overlooking Times Square, and I'm standing uh, standing there with my controller and looking at this giant <laughs> screen uh, in the middle of Times Square to go and play. Um, Tell me it had I the sound very well. just the blaring sound, just Sonic the Hedgehog all over Times Square. Yeah, that would have been fun. That would have been fun. <laughs> uh, didn't have the sound, but that would have been fun. Brilliant. Brilliant. Fantastic. So just bringing it back a little bit, because obviously... How you had all the initial, you know, targeting a new demographic. You saw off the turbo graphics. Uh, you re recorded our last conversation. You're saying that, uh, you know, retailers were saying to you that they'll they'll give you all their unsold Jet Sega Genesis inventory. <laughs> and I think you were you were quite happy to uh, prove them wrong <laughs> after that Christmas. Um, we were just happy to get shelf space, and you know, we knew that well, we, we, we could. We knew that we'd succeed against turbo graphics. We felt very well about that. Uh, and we proved it true. Um, but yeah, that, those were the, those were the early difficulties, you know, another video game system, you know, we're already selling, you know, Nintendo, uh, what do we need another video game system? What do we need two video game systems, NEC and Sega? Um, but we were able to go and uh, get some good, um, 
um, shelf space, uh, not in all the retailers, but it was able to go in and uh, help us to start make a dent in the U.S. business. Yes, yeah, great. Yeah, the hard ones were Walmart and Target, but we got them eventually. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. at, the, at the time in, uh, in, uh, in the US especially, you know, Nintendo was synonymous with, with video games or consoles. You didn't go play video games. You went to play Nintendo. So, uh, yeah, as you say, Al, trying, to, trying to get that little bit of shelf space at the beginning must have been, must have felt, you know, like a massive victory for you. But uh, it, it, it was, and, you know, uh, thank Dave Rhodes, who was our VP of sales at the time, uh, and his team. Um, and, you know, they got it well uh, and, and set us up for when Tom came in. To, and Tom helped really to go and get us into Target and Walmart, um, and, uh, which were important milestones in the history of Genesis. Okay, so uh, it's great to be here to talk about our time at Nintendo. Um, <laughs> Don't use the N-word, come on. <laughs> and there's sword. the air blowers, okay. <laughs> That's right, we can't hear them on this side. I think Zoom's got pretty good noise cancelling, so. Mm, yeah. I messaged Al that last weekend I, I was on, on a panel at the version of Comic-Con that's in Anaheim, California at the big convention center. It's called WonderCom. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of people there. Anyway, so I did I talked a little about Mattel and a little bit about Sega, but there were people in the audience who were just crazy about Sega, and they kept asking questions about Sonic and other games and what have you, and then after the thing was over... They brought up copies of the Console Warriors book I had to sign. They brought up uh, Sonic 2 seemed to be very popular for me to sign. <laughs> and uh, even, uh, other stuff, Hot Wheels cars and Barbie dolls and what have you. And the, the gal that I was on the panel with, a gal named Ernestine Fu, who's absolutely brilliant. She was on the cover of Forbes magazine a few years ago. Uh, she's a PhD from Stanford, master's from Stanford, undergrad from Stanford, a venture capitalist, started the company Jiffy Cat and uh, sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars. But anyway, so I'm signing these things and she says to me, you know, they're just going to go on eBay and sell that $10 product <laughs> for $200 now. <laughs> that's, that's why you hear a lot of people not actually doing autographs anymore. Like, I think like footballers or like soccer players over here, like I've heard of that, like they've stopped. Used to get like kids would stand outside with shirts and ask for autographs, mm. but the clubs have actually said not to do it. You can take a picture, you can do a selfie with a fan, but don't sign anything because, sadly, for every genuine fan that you've got who does want it to have it on a shelf or to frame it, there will be people who the first thing they'll do is go, boom, I can sell that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a shame. Yeah. Well, I get these letters every now and then, and I've stopped responding, from supposed school kids. So uh -huh. our, school, our school is having a contest who can get the most business cards signed by presidents or CEOs of companies. Could you sign these five cards? Or would you, they don't have the cards, would you sign five cards and send them to me? And I did that a couple times, and lo and behold, my wife found out they were selling them online for 70 bucks a piece. Wow. Hold on, I have to go and get your cards, Tom. selling right now. I'll be right back. I mean, you guys have got to be on your your Christmas card list, right? So you must have come to Tom's signature plenty of times, haven't you? Al? Oh yeah. Uh, well, oh, the, the Tom, your Christmas card. Wow, that could probably go four or five hundred bucks. <laughs> Sitting on a gold. Tom, one. actually, my my favorite thing that you signed was when we were at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. And somebody brought a Pico for you to sign. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it was like, it was mint in box. It was beautiful and you signed it. So that's a rare, rare item. Yeah, it so, is. Wow. Both in terms Pico of the was product a, and the product with your, your signature. Pico was the children's first computer that we brought out from mm -hmm. Sega. And uh, it actually did very quite well here, but the... Uh, the management in Japan said, stop wasting your time on that educational product. Just do another Sonic title or something or something like that. Some comment of that sort. But it was a great product. Yeah, really, I think we mentioned when we spoke last time, Tom, um, a couple of, like a year or so back, 
we, we actually said that it lasted longer than the Dreamcast, outlived the Dreamcast. And, and so it's like, it was Sega's, Sega's longest running piece of hardware, or aside from the like, yeah. master system in Brazil. But yeah. yeah, they were still selling that in 2006 in Japan. It's crazy. It's quite funny yeah, as well. No. My, my, my wife picked up a, a leapfrog tablet for her three year old nephew for his Christmas. And I said to my wife, went, Hot. Oh, I speak to the guy yeah, yeah. who, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the guy who runs him. It's like, but, really? Yeah, that's great product also. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's having great fun with it. It was brilliant. He's only three, and it's it's really really good. Did you get the English version or the U.S. version? Uh, I believe it was English version from pressing the demo buttons. It had an English accent from what I heard yeah. when I tried it. Yeah, so uh, yeah. so we we kind of green and white. One as well was yeah. not too big. He's only three, but that was really, really clever. Really, really good. So he's having great fun with that. Yeah. Well, if it's an English accent and if it says mum instead of mom, that's English version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was de definitely in demo mode. There was an English accent coming through there. So yeah. no, no, no Scottish version. No, no Scottish version. No, no one would understand that if, if it was a... a <laughs> an, that's what I keep laughing at as well whenever we have like, like guests or we, we go on podcasts where we're, we're with like American kind of hosts. I have to slow right down what I'm speaking because if, if I talk in, in my normal accent at normal speed, God help people, honestly. I, I do apologise. It's, like, it's like it can well, become like machine gun fire. It's like, well, you, I don't know if you remember, but I... When I joined Matchbox, I ended up firing a whole bunch of the senior London executives who were going to their private clubs at 11 and returning at 3 in the afternoon, smashed. And <laughs> I promoted all these young guys. And one of the young guys was a guy named Nick Austin, and who lived in London. The other one was John Barber, who was Scottish. Right. And he was he was terrific. He straightened out the marketing across Europe. I brought him to the U.S. He did the same thing in the U.S. And then he became president of Toys R Us U.S. Hmm. And then when I went to Leapfrog, and after I was at Leapfrog for a while, um, went up to be chairman, mm -hmm. I hired John Barber to run Leapfrog. So he actually, the leap pad you have probably was developed while John Barber was uh, <laughs> running it here in the U.S. <laughs> and he certainly has a Scottish accent, but I could understand him just fine. But I mean, <laughs> glad, glad to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, super! I love, I love all these stories. Honestly, it's like, it's, uh, it's great that there's all these kind of wee nuances and kind of different wee background stories that maybe, you know, what well, that's what we try to do on this as well. Because obviously we've had John before, and we kind of went into the kind of more, I think, commonly known stuff. But I think digging into these kind of wee, just letting you two kind of bounce off each other and maybe talk about different stories as well as it's maybe something a wee bit different because as I said on on Twitter like no one that I can think of has had both of you on at the one time there was the Sega 60th YouTube video where you were on with there was another lady I, I, God, I forget her name that you were on with um, no, I that, that's it yeah um, and it was for the Sega 60th anniversary and it was only maybe five six minutes long but every podcast I've seen it's either only Al or only Tom, and I thought, let's just get you on at the same time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. well, fine. Okay. <laughs> Happy. Happy. You got us. us. <laughs> Since this is, a, this is a regular lunchtime thing, isn't it, for you guys? You know, having a, <laughs> you guys meeting up and catching up. Absolutely. So, I think last time, I think, Tom, just before we lost you, you were just telling us about the, uh, you know, how Sega managed to find their way into Walmart uh once you once you'd come on board. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which yeah, is uh yeah. which is a great uh, yeah I don't know if you wanted to pick up from there. Should I tell that story again? Yeah cool. you, you got cut we cut off, we got cut off last time and uh oh okay okay yeah, yeah. I, was, I, oh, I, I, I picked up a little bit from you. But uh right. yeah take two yeah <laughs> it's it's a great uh, uh history lesson I guess on how to get into a retail that doesn't want you at that time but it, it really hurt my feelings because um you know i knew sam walton uh when i was at mattel we, mattel was a big customer of of walmart's and uh, uh or a big uh, supplier to walmart should i say and sam himself loved barbie dolls and i think the reason he loved barbie dolls was because our sales person was a very attractive 40-ish 
year old woman who lived in the south she actually lived in atlanta and she had this nice southern accent and she and mr sam would talk to each other and it was really hard for me to understand them actually but anyway uh so i knew everybody in walmart every senior senior manager and senior manager there and they would not buy sega and the reason was they were afraid that nintendo would stop shipping them hardware and software and so they uh they they wouldn't carry us and uh we passed a uh a, off of Highway 41 in Bentonville, Arkansas, there was a strip mall, and there was an empty store for rent. So we rented that store, and we put in as many Genesis pecked up to uh, TVs as we could, with a, put a big sign out front, come play Sega for free, and then we bought all the billboards up and down Highway 41, uh, all the way up to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and bought the seat cushions in the University of Arkansas a football stadium and on one side it was you know the seat cushion would be a color white or blue or red and on the other side it, we had a big sega printed and so people would hold up the seat cushions according to instructions for somebody in there down below them on the field and it would spell something out on the on the on the on the in the stands but when they turned those over you all you saw across the stadium was sega 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 all <laughs> over the stadium uh and then we bought radio and tv time in out of in and out of uh, bentonville uh and i would call up the buyer at the time a senior buyer and i'd say rick last week we outsold nintendo by 25 percent at toys r us and 30 percent at target just thought you want to know that click <laughs> and i did that every i did that every week and finally rick calls me back and he says kalinsky you got to just stop it i said stop what rick said, stop the store we'll close it down take the billboards down and stop all this advertising you're doing in Bentonville because my board of directors is demanding that i carry sega and you're they're driving me crazy and okay i'll do it i'll give you four feet and that was that was how we got into Walmart. Oh, really? feet as well. So how how long did it take for you to get more of that kind of retail spaces? Obviously, four feet's quite. It was a, it was a start. Yeah, it was a yeah. start. It's a and foot a, in the door. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And as Sega Genesis and all our software started outselling Nintendo, our space. You know, I think Nintendo had like sixteen feet or something. Our space grew and grew and grew, and finally we were the equal of of Nintendo in terms of shelf space at at all WalMarts across the country, and they became our largest customer. Wow, there you go. That must have felt like a big victory, though, especially given Nintendo's. So it's quite funny when you look at all of everything in the gaming news right now around. Both it was Microsoft and Activision. Now, the most recent news is uh, Sony is being questioned in Japan for kind of unfair practices. So, is that yeah. right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. they've, they've stuck their nose in between the Activision and Microsoft deal. So, there's talk of legal ramifications against Sony for their corporate actions. And just remember, they used to talk about games in, in video <laughs> games. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never catch on. The name of the game is anything but a game, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so that must have felt like a massive victory for you guys, you know, at the time getting those getting that space in Walmart. And as you say, they became your biggest cu customer in the end. Was there any other, you know, victories like that, getting shelf space in retailers? Well, another one that, that actually happened before Walmart was Target. Target wasn't carrying us either. And, uh, and their reason was they said that... Uh, that uh, Sega of America did not, had not lived up to its commitments and didn't deliver our, uh, the, the titles when they said they were going to or do it on time or what have you, and, and they were quite negative about us. But I sent the uh, president of Target a Game Gear, and I guess I did to others in their staff, senior staff. And a little while later, he called me up and he said, you know, my wife loves that game columns on the Game Gear. <laughs> and, and I guess that's how, that's what got us into Target. <laughs> yep. uh, the legacy of columns. Yeah. <laughs> that was on the, the four in one um, cartridge that I got with my Game Gear. It was, uh, it was a tennis game, a little kind of rally game, a penalty kicks game in columns. That was the four games that I got on that four in one cartridge with with my Game Gear back in the day. Absolutely wow. brilliant. Oh yeah, that you could that would last a long time. 
That was great. <laughs> that, that, that penalty kick scheme was addictive as hell, I'm telling you. It was so good. <laughs> It would last a long time as long as the batteries lasted. Well, <laughs> that's true. I'll, I've told this story on this podcast before. I had the the big battery pack that used to clip on your belt, and you know the you know eleven year old me thought I was at the, the peak of technology, getting on the the bus to go to the shops, putting my fare in, asking the driver for a return ticket with my game gear in one hand and my belt clip with my battery. I ain't running out on this journey. I'm, <laughs> I'm playing Game Gear to the shops and all the way back. <laughs> way to do it. Well, it's an important console for, for both of you as well, isn't it? Because obviously, you know, a lot of your tales come from the Genesis side of things, but obviously the Game Gear was, I think it was the first console that you saw. Was it Tom? One of the first two. Well, no, I, I, I saw Genesis when I Mega Drive Genesis when I went to Japan from Hawaii and I and he and I saw what became Game Gear at the time right. and I really was impressed by that because at, at Mattel I had known about the popularity of of handheld games right with the racing game and the football game we had and uh, and uh, we we actually marketed them to fathers on Father's Day mm-hmm. and very very successful so I had some familiarity with gee ha- being able to hold a game in your hand is a pretty cool thing. Mm-hmm. And so I was very impressed by the color screen on Game Gear versus the black and white screen at, in Game Boy, uh, and was pretty sure we were going to have a big hit in our hands, and and of course we did. Yeah, it's still uh, still one of the most successful handholds of all time. I mean, I know people like to compare it against the Game Boy, which was a, a bit of a phenomenon, but it was the highest selling non Nintendo handheld all the way up until the PlayStation Portable came out. Yeah, color. As I do the as I do the TV ad from the US. Uh, Some of those ads you guys ran to poke fun at the the Game Boy though, but the the guy would say, you know, do not be deceived by the attempts of the this one color system to you know make itself look more interesting. And there was like it was dressed up as a cake, or it was dressing like a it was like a wee dress, and there was even one that had bondage gear on and all that. I was like, I see some risky <laughs> advertising that's going on here. But I mean, the 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 thing with the game gear, I don't know if you guys kind of keep your your eyes on the kind of development in terms of mods to keep these kind of consoles going in the modern era but you can now put like a an ips display in a game gear you know you can also have like usb-c um charging you can put rechargeable batteries in there as well recap it new soundboards i mean literally you can bring the whole thing right up to modern spec now and it's crazy to see that the community are actually still driving these not just to improve the original design, but to keep it living as long as possible. That there's, I think there's three different variants of screen, of different kind of budgets and different mm-hmm. install kind of, you huh. know, um, difficulties to choose from. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. So, you know, all the Sega systems have all got these little kind of community mods yeah. in them that are just keeping them alive. It's it's, a, it's fascinating. You know, thirty odd years later, that it's, they're still going. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's really great. My, by the way, my favorite Game Gear commercial was where we had the dog drinking out of the toilet, and and the, and the voiceover would say something like, "If you are kind of like a dog and can't see colors and only black and white, I guess you'd like Game Boy. But if you like colors, you better play with Game Gear." <laughs> <laughs> And we yeah. heard that that was the commercial Nintendo really did not like. Oh, he uh, <laughs> Howard Lincoln hated that commercial. The president of uh, of uh, Nintendo in the U.S. He sent me a letter, a cease and desist letter, and I said, "Why? <laughs> you're, you're, you're diminishing our product. You're defaming it. It's not fair." Blah blah blah. <laughs> I just laughed at him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, quite sensitive. So was it? Dog, well. dog, colorblind, Game Boy. <laughs> you know, but the interesting thing, and I, and you know, we haven't talked about it a lot over the years. And and Tom, I'm not even sure you know this. Um, Game Gear was almost not our first uh, handheld system. Uh, when we were getting ready to launch Genesis, um, Sega was in discussions with Atari 
and about possibly marketing the Atari Lynx under the Sega brand. Wow. And so when we were building the um, booth for the uh, June Consumer Electronics Show in 1989, where we launched Genesis, um, I had a separate area and display stands all set just in case the decision was made for us to go and carry the links. Um, so, um, but that never went through. And so Atari went and did that. But, you know, it, it, it was an interesting relationship because even before I joined Sega, Sega hadn't decided yet whether Sega of America was going to market um, the 16-bit system. And they were talking to others and there was a big discussion with Atari. And Atari wanted to go and market uh, Mega Drive slash Genesis, but they decided to go and um, let Sega of America do it, and I was hired to go in and run marketing on that. Um, but they still kept talking to Atari, and it was like, "How about this other thing you got? You know, can we do it?" Um, <laughs> wow, but, uh, th that's I heard true, that but, story. Yeah, I yeah, heard that story. But that would have been, you know, just an incredible launch uh, at June CES, not just sixteen bit. Uh, Genesis, but you know, a color portable. The Sega um, Lynx. The Sega Lynx. I don't know what we would have called. We hadn't, you know, uh, come to the point where we decided what to go and call it. Um, and because it was just kind of like we were so just focused on getting the Genesis out the door, but I had, you know, all the displays built and figured out we'll move this out here and we'll put, you know, the portable there. Jeez, um, was that I close? I think it was probably, I think it was probably a couple of months beforehand when you know the deal went and fell through, um, and so you know the rest is history. Yep, another sliding doors moment, as we say, we could have had the maybe they've not named that, but the Sega Lynx, and obviously Tom, we spoke previously about that kind of deal to try and get Sega and Sony to work together so we could have had the Sega PlayStation as well. So <laughs> right we had the Sega PlayStation. Jeez. Um, the one thing that we were happy that we, that we did not have was we were presented with it and, um, you know, did some investigation and some research was the technology that ended up being Nintendo uh, Virtual Boy. Uh, Virtual Boy. Yeah. That's uh, right. And we decided, you know, it just wasn't something that we could go and make some great games with. Uh, you know, we were concerned at the time, you know, could you go and injure yourself uh, wearing it? Because mm. um, the resolution wasn't that great. Uh, and, and there were a lot of other reasons, and we turned it down. And yeah. lo and behold, look who went and picked up what we rejected. Uh, <laughs> and. And the market proved that, Tom, we were correct. You were right. <laughs> it wouldn't but, be the last um, time either. Um, it wouldn't that, be the last time. That, that Nintendo would pick up for Sega and uh, <laughs> knocks back. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, that was... Because uh, um, we were, you know, we always looked at lots of different kinds of technology and new things that were coming out. And... Um, you know, people would be presenting it. But that, that was one of the most interesting ones where we flat out rejected it and uh, Nintendo picked it up and then Amazing. basically dropped it out of their line. <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, I, I, I had no idea about that or the um, or the Atari Lynx, so that's amazing to hear. I knew that, I think Sega, sorry, must have been quite close at some point around that era because, as you say, I think... Atari were close to publishing the, the the Genesis, and I think it may have been that the the name Genesis was formed while those discussions were, were going on. And um, it was Mike Katz, wasn't it, who was yes head of Sega of America before you came over, Tom? And uh, was he who hired you out? No, 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 no. I Mike didn't come on until about six months after I um, right. was there. He came on. Uh, we had already launched Genesis. He came on probably October, I think, of ninety of eighty nine. So no, um, in, in fact, Mike had actually been, you know, at Atari, um, yeah. you know, before that. I'm not sure when he left Atari 
um, and, and the crossover between the two. But um, yeah, so no, so Mike came on, you know, much later, oh, and did. then Tom left. I predated everybody. I'm the original. <laughs> the original. I'm the OG. That's that. <laughs> the original. I'm the OG. You know, and so uh, you know, it, it was myself, um, David Rhodes, who had the sales, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Nakajima, who was our interim president. Um, Paul Rio came, and Tom and I both had, you know, worked very closely with Paul at Mattel, um, and uh, a couple of other people. So it was, it was a very, very small group back in the early days of Sega of America, yeah. um, because prior to launching Genesis, Sega of America um, was kind of a holding company because the uh, master system was being sold and marketed by Tonka Toys. Um, and all Sega of America was doing was um, we were a repair center for broken master systems, and we had that back in our warehouse. And then the game counselors who answered the calls and helped you with playing master system games were also at Sega of America. Uh, so that, that was basically uh, what Sega was. And, uh, you know, then a very small core group of people were launched, uh, were hired to kind of rejuvenate, revitalize Sega of America and um, launch this new 16-bit system. Um, you know, as part of my interview, I, I uh, Steve Hanawa, one of our um, technical guys, uh, brought me into his office. He handed me this controller and had me play Altered Beast, and, which I, I had never seen a system. And I played it, and he goes, wow, you're pretty good. And that was the end of the interview. <laughs> so, you know, it was just kind of like, and so, uh, yeah, I guess that's why Sega hired me, you know. Yep. You, you were the game and, guy. <laughs> yeah. He was a good uh, game player. No, so it, it was fun. But, uh, yeah, and then Tom came on board, and the rest is history. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Tom, you get made him work harder. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, you get tracked down while you're on your holiday. You get whisked off to Sega Japan, convinced to join Sega. So, did you both know that you were, you know, at Sega at the time? Was it a surprise to see each other in the office, or you know, were you, did you know? Was it like, hey, there's Tom, there's Al, or was it, you know? Did you did you know beforehand that you that you were both there? I knew beforehand that he was there and that Paul was uh, connected somehow, and I uh, certainly knew David Rhodes was there. Um, he had worked for me at Matchbox prior to going to Sega, um, and and I think uh, Al, didn't you hear a rumor that I was joining or something? There there was a rumor that you were joining. Um, you know, it was, it was really strange because, yeah, we heard a rumor that you were joining, but, uh, and we were excited uh, if it was true. You know, Paul and I went and discussed it. Uh, you know, but the interesting one was um, when Mike Katz was interviewing, we were down in LA and going to visit with David Rosen, the founder of Sega, and, um, and, and meet with him. And as we were pulling into the parking lot of this building, the car pulling out was my cats. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> hold on, what's Mike doing here? And then we went and put, uh, you know, two and two together. It's like, I guess Mike's coming. So we had visual proof of him. We just heard rumors about you. <laughs> uh, no, I loved, I loved that kind of. Uh, I, I did like that kind of graphic in the the the, um, the console wars documentary that it, it kind of shows you walking into the office of Sega of America. It's like a, a kind of your office was a wee back room at the back of this warehouse, and you had a wee energy bar, and you just went and you seen what was going on and sat at your desk, and it, it just showed your energy levels just <laughs> depleting as if what what have I come into well, here? Kind of thing that the, the challenge that was in front of you. 
Yeah, you had that beautiful view of the parking lot, Tom. Yeah, it was a little daunting. Uh, but it was fun, you know, and and actually it turned out to be a, a really good team of people. And, of course, we hired a lot more, but we ended up with a very good team of, of people. Excellent team. Yeah, I was going to say, because you were, you, you soon, it wasn't that long until you moved, was it? You started moving. And, and was that before uh, Sonic came along or was that was that after? It was before. You, it was before. And I, and I uh, actually... Paul Real was living in L.A. and I was living in L.A. and so we we shared a, a one of those hotel rooms where you have a kitchenette and all that stuff. I can't remember the name of the one we went to, but uh, we literally were in the same uh, suite, if you will, at a hotel or motel near near Sega of America, and uh, so we'd work late and then we'd go back and have uh, take out Kentucky Fried Chicken or something and beer and watch a baseball game on TV. And that was what I did for probably six months before I moved up here and and uh, moved my wife and kids up here. Yeah, it's just like staying out with the boys, <laughs> beer, beer and chicken and sports. <laughs> <laughs> superb, superb. So we, we can't have this conversation without talking about Sonic. Um, do you remember when you first saw him? Let's <laughs> see. Yeah. I was reaction there. Do you remember when you first saw him? Did you know he was going to be a hit straight away? I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I first saw him, I was in Japan. Um, and every month and a half I was in Japan, uh, both for just general work and meetings, but also to go and see what was happening in R&D. And one day I, I walked into R&D and there were two monitors side by side. Uh, next to one of the programmer's desks. And on one was this wireframe with a loop-to-loop, -loop, and there was just something racing through it. And then on the, and I had no idea what was racing through it, but it was very fast. And then on the next screen was this beautiful background, uh, so colorful, detailed, with the same loop to loop and you know i'm going does that go in that and i go yeah and then i go closer and it's like hold on is that that hedgehog that i went and saw seven months ago on <laughs> you know on this single piece of paper and they go yeah and i go can you get that speed out of the genesis and I go, yeah. And it was just, it, it was amazing. And so I got to meet Naka and, you know, they showed me some of the designs for the others. And then I came back to SOA and as, as Paul and Shinobu talk about it, I didn't shut up about this new game that I saw. <laughs> I just kept, you got to see it. You won't believe it because... It was it was just the combination of the graphics and the speed. It was like there is something special here, uh, and forget that it was even a hedgehog because you know we we didn't know what hedgehogs really were in the U.S. Uh, back then. But you know, and it's kind of, I remember it's like well, when can we get it? When can we go and get a copy? When can we go and get a copy? I think it was close to a month till we finally you know got a ROM uh, very very early. And so that everybody else, uh, you know, on the management team at the SOA could go and, you know, see what I had been raving about uh, yeah. back then. Um, and that's when we put a lid on where we're going to keep this under wraps. We're not going to go and talk about it publicly. Because uh, if this continues to develop as we think it is, you know, this really can be our secret weapon against super whatever they were going to go and call it. Uh, the new system um, when it launches in the U.S. So um, you know, that that was my first scene um, of the product in action. Yeah. Um, and what what were your thoughts, Tom? Well, you know, I think you had shown me drawings or something uh, b before I saw anything on a screen. So I saw physical drawings first, and then. Uh, it was kind of interesting, uh, and there weren't too many 
great other candidates to start with yeah. <laughs> for, a, for a lead game. Uh, but then, uh, but then when we saw the game itself, I mean, that was just, and, and by the way, we all believed in Al's opinion and trusted Al on this too. But when we saw it, we were all really impressed, really, really impressed, obviously. And, and uh, decided this was going to be our, our lead, our lead product. And, uh, I'm really happy we made the decision to take Altered Beast out of the Genesis <laughs> and put Sonic the Hedgehog, the first one, in, because uh, I think that really people had to play that game and they would buy the yeah. system just to play that one game. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that was really always really a kind of the, the core strength of having that. Like, people talk today about exclusives selling systems, and I think, yeah, you've got an element of that. Sony have got a kind of really big first party kind of studio element that they sell their consoles on but you are seeing a lot more of that merging of third parties doesn't matter what console you go to you can pretty much get the same experience but there was nothing like sonic at that time mm -hmm. i mean it literally any glimpse of it you got I me mean, again remember i was what 12 whenever sonic came out in the uk um and any glimpse you could get of it was just exciting if you didn't have the console like you would watch like the the shows over here, like Games Master that would come on later on. Mm -hmm. That would they would have like challenges, you know. So it'd be like collect as many rings as you can in sixty seconds, or how fast can you complete Green Hill Zone Act One? And even the excitement of if you didn't have the system, if you knew that Sonic was going to be a challenge on that episode, you were tuning in just to see Sonic. You know, it was it was that powerful a draw. I don't think you'd ever felt anything like that. In gaming before up until that point yeah it, it, it was it was a must-have you know and um the one that you know the one game that i could go and say did something similar was um space invaders on the atari 2600 because mm -hmm. there were a lot of atari people had bought the atari 2600 played it and then kind of stopped playing it put it in the um um, closet and when Space Invaders came out all of a sudden it brought the units that were in the closet back into use again and then revived once again the sales of the Atari 2600 um, so you know it had the same kind of trajectory as Sonic did uh, though, we, though Sonic had a greater percentage of sales to the installed base than um, uh, Space Invaders did. Why do I need this trivia? I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it, it's, these are, uh, you know, it was the must-haves, and, and um, you know, it was part of the four-point plan of, of, you know, changing the destiny of Sega uh, and putting you know, Sonic in the, in the box. By the way, I, I am the person responsible for Altered Beast in the in the original Genesis box. Oh, shame uh, on you. <laughs> well, no, it's uh, actually, um, when we had to make the decision, there were only four games to choose from. Really? Um, and, you know, it was the helicopter game, and which were, they were arcade ports, the original yeah. arcade ports. And uh, for cost purposes, I was told I had to choose only the smallest ROM size because um, uh, I think it was the fifth game which had instead of maybe it was a four meg instead of a two meg. I don't remember that Jeez. specifically. And yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> and you know, today, you know, a digital delivery or a CD. You know, it's the same price if it's a small or large. Back then, how much you know uh, ROM space took dictated how much it cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bigger the game, the more ROM space it was. Um, and you know, those were decisions we had to make during development. Where it's kind of like, yeah, I, we love that level in the game, but it won't fit in the ROM, and we have to go and take it out. But anyway, back to Ultra Beast. The the four games. While they were Sega arcade translations, they didn't have a lot of length of gameplay because mm -hmm. they were they were quarter droppers. Where you're in an arcade, you uh, put the quarter in, 
you play for a little bit, you die, you've got to put in another quarter. And so there wasn't a lot of, you know, sustained initial gameplay in those. So the best pro title out of the four um, was um, Altered Beast. And it also looked good on the package and things like that. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it was the best decision at the time. Yeah. Uh, even if later on, you know, we got complaints from parents and others who were thinking that, you know, as we're saying, rise from the grave, it was some kind of devil worship <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, um, in middle America, they thought it was devil worship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, you were the one who got the letters, Tom. So that was, you know, that, that was, the, that was why we were happy that you were there, Tom. Because you got the letters and had to go and answer them. Right. You know, right. I, I no yeah. longer had to go and answer them. But, um, yeah, but, you know, it, it's, uh, Sonic was just a, you know, entity upon itself. And, you know, I've told the story about how, you know, Sega Japan had had this contest to choose a new mascot. They came down to these two things, and Mr. Nakayama, the head of uh, Sega Worldwide, went and said, it has to work in the U.S., because <clears throat> that's where, you know, the biggest sales are. Send it over and have Al go and choose it. And I was given a, a color drawing of Sonic and his rock band and his human girlfriend named Madonna, which I'm sure you've all seen pictures of. And then this egg, and so you know, <laughs> Sonic. Sonic was the least of, you know, the best of two evils, or the best of who knows what they were. There was no <laughs> gameplay described. There was no thing that you know he's going to go and be the fastest character around. Didn't know that, um, but you know that's how Sonic was chosen, uh, and, and it and it just worked. And you know when and. We tied it to the launch of, you know, Super NES. Uh, when they launched at CES, we launched Sonic. And then afterwards, we went and did a tour of shopping malls around the country with a big stage with um, four giant monitors. Giant at the time was 32 inches. Uh, and um, on two of the monitors were Sonic, and on one of the monitors was Super Mario, because uh, we had imported the Super Famicom systems over from uh, Japan so that people could go and see Mario because Nintendo wasn't promoting it yet. And we asked people to play them both. We wanted them to play both the new Mario that they had never seen and this hedgehog thing, and then vote which one uh, was their preferred. And there was a journalist who went and, you know, called me and said, you know, Al, this is a scam. You know, you're just going to stuff the ballot box and say Sonic wins. And I said, why don't you come and you be the judge? You know, we're going to go and be in Seattle as our first stop. Why don't you be in charge? And you're the one who counts the votes and you make sure that everybody has gone in play <laughs> and that it's a, it's a good election. And um, it was just... No dominion, okay. no voting machine. No, no voting machines. You had to go and, you know, mark, you had to go and mark it and you know, paper ballots. And, uh, and so um, the first stop, as I said, was in Seattle. It was about three or four miles from Nintendo's headquarters, chosen on purpose. And um, it was the highest preference for Sonic over Mario, which was something like 88% of the people who voted chose Sonic instead of Mario. Um, and you know, there was, no, I think, as we went, there was no market that was higher, uh, lower than 84% choosing Sonic. Because um, it was just something new. It was something different. The speed, the beautiful graphics. Yeah, we knew Mario, but it didn't offer, you know, this newness. This excitement has got to play, got to have. Look at those great graphics. I want to go around and look, look how fast it is. And watch a hedgehog also. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, that was, um, you know, part of the original strategy, but it was also part of showing why Sonic just was 
so, so special. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And why we're talking about it, you know, decades and decades and decades later. So I, mean, I love how you uh, your contract. No, so I'm just wondering. I was, I'm going to the kind of next question I was going to ask was, uh, if you may want to jump back, Dan, if you've got something else to add before we move on to that. But with the success of Sonic, you knew you had this hit in your hands. You're looking at this and you're going, right, this is better than any new, uh, you know, iteration of Mario that's out. How soon after Sonic One hit did you go, right, Nakasan, Sonic Two? What have you got? Was there a, was there a quite a, a gap between it or did you go, right, let's just strike while the iron's hot here, let's get the sequel worked on? How how soon was that that was Sonic 2 put into development? I, I think it was uh, just a few months later. Right. Um, so there was one problem that we had, which was Naka had quit Saga, Sega. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that was a big problem. That, yeah. That, that, that was a small little problem. Mm. And, he's uh, he's, he's shown know, to be uh, quite a, a volatile individual in, in recent <laughs> months, Mr. Nucker. He's in, he's in the news for other reasons just now, as we've seen. So, um... you know, all I'll say, phenomenal game designer. And we, uh, we owe it to Shinobu Toyota, mm. uh, one of the executive VPs at, at Sega of America, who came up with the idea of, because we knew we wanted Sonic 2. We, we had to have a sequel because it was just so great. And he came up with the idea of instead of having the product developed in the U.S., have it developed in, um, rather, instead of having it developed in Japan, have it developed in the U.S. And in, um, we would hire Naka back and the key members of his team and bring them over into the U.S., working side by side with, uh, the people in one of our development groups, the Sega Technical Institute, um, to go in, and develop it. And um, Naka liked the idea. And uh, the rest is history. What a great game we got. Yeah, it was a good development, too. You know, got a, a, the best of the developers we had here and the best they had in Japan and moved them he together and uh, right down the street from where our headquarters was. And it just worked really well. Hid them in an unmarked building. His <laughs> <laughs> location was known only to a few people. No, it's it's true. It's true. It was not on the Sega campus with you know the rest of R and D and the rest of the group that was there. It was down the road. Um, a secret bunker. Uh, so secret. It was a secret bunker, you know, and um, we did not, uh, you know, disturb them. And so it was, um, but it worked. You know? I mean, that's, yeah, I mean that, that's putting it that's putting it lightly. I mean, it was it was the, the second game was an enormous success, and of course, you guys made history. If Sonic Tuesday was if, if, if celebrated its thirty year anniversary just last November, um, which you know you guys must be incredibly proud that you, you basically changed the way that video games are distributed forever. Yeah, it was the first time that uh, something like that had ever been done, where every retailer in almost the world got the product at the same time, the same day, so you could have it all promoted, a big, massive promotion on one day, Tuesday, Sonic Tuesday. Uh, thank God for Emory Air Freight back in those days. They <laughs> gained us. <laughs> My wife wants to know how much longer I'm going to be. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I can really sympathize with that, because I get that all the time, Tom. You know, it's like... <laughs> yeah, she's got to go somewhere, I guess, and she wants me to babysit our new puppy. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> Tom, whatever, whatever you need, will we'll, this has been great. So, well, any more we'll work uh, on your schedule and, and your wife's schedule? Any more questions? Yeah, you... we'll, we'll, we'll ask a couple more if, if, if that's uh, if, if you've got time, Tom. But I think I think pick your best. Yeah, I think one thing that we wanted to ask was. You know, you had so much success with the the Genesis and the, and the Game Gear. When you stepped into the 32-bit era, obviously there was a lot of conversations between Sega America and Sega Japan. But what was what was the overall strategy? What was the, and what was your perception of what the flagship system was going to be at the time? Mm 
Well, we were, remember, we, they did the hardware pretty much in Japan and kind of told us what it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so they were, they were working on the, on the specs and uh, our head of R&D, Joe Miller, uh, felt that what was going to become Saturn, frankly, wasn't good enough. And one of his objections was he knew about this new thing coming along called the Internet. And he thought there should be Internet connectivity, connectivity uh, right away uh, in the new system. And that was one of his complaints. I, I don't remember what his other ones were. But anyway, technically, he had some some issues with what was going to become Saturn. And so I kind of took up that that argument with with Japan, and that's when we had the discussion of, well, why don't we do a joint system with with Sony and Sony of America, uh, Olaf Olafsson and Mickey Shuloff agreed with that, and um, and so did their bosses in in Japan, but Nakayama-san wouldn't, wouldn't hear of it. He just didn't he didn't agree with that, so that didn't happen. And then I had a discussion with Jim Clark, who was chairman of Silicon Graphics here in here in Silicon Valley. And they, of course, Silicon Graphics makes these great uh, graphic chips uh, and computers. And he had a guy working for him named Jess, Jen, Jensen Wang. You might know that name. He's now the founder and CEO of NVIDIA. But anyway, Jensen had come up with a new chipset that Jim called me and said, hey, this is perfect for video gameplay. Uh, come and look at it. So Joe and I went over and looked at it, and we agreed. We thought, boy, this is this is really good. This could be better than what they're doing in Japan. And we called Japan, and Japan sent uh, over their head of engineering of hardware who looked at it and, and basically poo-pooed it and said, oh, that's just too big of a chipset. In manufacturing, there'll be too much waste, i.e., the chip's so big that the, when you cut the big silicon disk into little wafers, uh, there'll be too much that gets thrown away. And so that was their reason for for not for not doing that. So I'd had two strikeouts there. I I failed with uh, with uh, Sony and I failed with uh, Silicon Graphics and and pretty much was then forced to introduce Saturn at that upcoming uh, June when we 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 had been planning all along to introduce it in September. Mm -hmm. I had to do it earlier. And we didn't have enough hardware to supply retailers that who wanted the hardware. We didn't have enough software, uh, certainly not enough titles to support it. And that was pretty much the straw that broke my back. And that was when I decided to to leave to leave Sega. I mean, the, the one thing, Tom, as well, that I always wonder is obviously 32X shared huh. the same CPU architecture that used two Hitachi SH2 CPUs, the same as the Saturn. And... Did no one at Sega of Japan ever think we're telling the West to launch Saturn early? They don't have enough stock. So for every 32X being made, you were sort of taking away a Saturn. So that, it's always baffled me that did that never twig with anybody that they were actually cannibalizing stock of their own upcoming machine by manufacturing the 32X? Yeah, well, and the 32X was supposed to help keep the Genesis 16-bit alive longer, <laughs> uh, which was part of the strategy, and that didn't really work either. And we didn't have enough software for 32X either, so, yeah. so <laughs> we were really hurting on the software side. Yeah, James, part, part of the what was being said to us uh, from Sega Japan was, yes, there is a similar architecture between the two. So as you're learning to program for 32X, you're in effect learning to how to go and, you know, uh, yeah, work with two processors Saturn. and being able to go and do that. And it's going to go and help you with Saturn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it was four times we went and said, no, we don't want 32X. Um, and because it was just, we knew there wasn't going to be a lot of software early on. It was such an expensive add-on. Plus, we were trying to sell Sega CD, um, you know, to and get that. So it's kind of like, so you buy the Genesis, and then you buy, you know, the Sega CD and all the software there, and then 32X, and it confuses the customer, mm -hmm. and it confuses the retailer, it confuses the press, and it confused us. Yeah, uh, it was just too, too much. You know, it was, it, it was just... 32x was just not the right product uh you know it was not the right product uh, and unfortunately um 
we were kind of forced into going in and bringing it to market. It would be a lot easier if there was just one 32 bit system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, th did you ever feel uh, something I've always wondered as well is because you two are arguably the kind of the, the kind of the men behind the team who gave Sega its, its greatest Western era. Like, obviously, the Saturn remains Sega of Japan's darling. It's the, the console that beat Nintendo in Japan, it outsold the N64 over there. But in terms of, you know, the actual appeal, the success, the sheer numbers that was done in the West, the, the Genesis slash Mega Drive remains that golden era. Did you ever feel that that kind of lack of control that you were you, you were seeing your control taken away with the Saturn kind of coming over? Do you ever feel there was maybe a wee bit of resentment from Sega of Japan that you did it a bit better than them, that you, you had more success in them ultimately? It was their products, their technology, but you took the ball and you ran with it and you made that a success. And then all of a sudden, at the height of that, you're having that carpet pulled from underneath you. Yeah, did ever, did I, 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 knew, I didn't quite under. I knew it was happening, but I didn't understand why. And it, mm -hmm. while I'm still with Sega, but later I learned why. And and you, I think you'll appreciate this exactly to your point. Um, every Monday there's a meeting in the so-called decision room in in Japan, and all the heads of the different departments are in there along with some other people. And Nakayama-san would come into the room and he would criticize them for not being as successful as we were in Sega of America and Sega of Europe. And uh, after a while, you know, he'd walk around the room and he'd, he'd get in the faces of the head of sales, the head of marketing, the heads, the heads of R&D, different R&D departments, and, and basically demean them that they weren't as successful as, as Tom was in the U.S. <laughs> I wish he hadn't used my name, but anyway... Uh, <laughs> After you have that happen to you uh, 20 Mondays in a row, you don't want to help that guy over there in <laughs> no. the States. You know, you, you hope he fails. You hope he goes away. So that, that well, I learned. And you also want to show that they know better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the other cra the crazy thing was all during that period of time, every now and then they'd send over something like, oh, here's a here's a commercial on you name it uh, game. Why don't you just dub this in English and use this one instead of spending $50,000 on a new commercial? And my response would be, well, but you guys aren't successful in Japan. <laughs> Why should we do what you're, what you're failing with? Why should we do the same thing over here? I don't think they like that too much either. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't imagine if you went the other way, having a big, bully kind of prison inmate with a leather jacket and a tutu going bug. I don't think that would quite <laughs> have the, the same impact if you went over to Japan with that. So, um, no, I, I've always wondered that if perhaps uh, there was a bit of that kind of resentment there that you had delivered such a level of success that perhaps, you know, if their technology, you done this, you were the most successful in their kind of brief home console era and they kind of felt that they had to try and take a wee bit of that control back. I've always kind of wondered that. No, that's what happened. My wife says she has to be somewhere at four, and it's a 30-minute drive, so I'm going to probably have to go pretty soon. No, that's not no, that's at all. fine. I think yeah. we'll, we'll finish with one last question. Um, yeah. I think 2022 was quite a big year for Sega, and so I just wanted to ask both of you if either of you had enjoyed you know, any of the new... The new Sonic movie that came out, which used a lot of the uh, old Sonic the Hedgehog 2 uh, uh, iconography uh, in its advertising. There's the new Mega Drive Mini 2, as uh, the new Sonic Frontiers game. Have you seen any of those? Uh, what were your thoughts on any of those? Well, we've seen the movies for sure. We saw Sonic 1 and Sonic 2, and I, and I must say I loved the movies. I thought well, they we... did an excellent job. Yep. And Jim Carrey was excellent, but the animation was excellent. So I'm, I'm really excited that Sonic 3 is coming out, I guess, in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll be, that'll be great to see. And I think we mentioned to you uh, last time, maybe we didn't, that there's going to be a new Toe Jam and Earl movie coming out. Are, are we supposed to say that, Al? It, it's been publicly announced. So okay, and then there's a Streets we, of Rage movie coming out yeah. as well. So yeah, so pretty excited about three movies based on things that we worked on uh, coming out in the near future. Yeah. Streets of Rage I, why, launched. Why did Streets of Rage not get its fourth game on the Saturn? Why did nobody make? <laughs> I don't know. I don't God. know. 
<laughs> it was right there. It was right there. Use it. <laughs> How about yourself, Al? Have you played well, Black you know, Mini 2 or seen the movies? You know, just going back to Streets of Rage, Street, you're asking about Streets of Rage 4. Streets of Rage 2 almost didn't make it. Okay. And no. arguably the best game in the series. Yeah. And because the team wanted to work on another game. And SOJ wanted them to work on another game because the Japanese version, which was called Bare Knuckle, mm -hmm. uh, did not do well. And so, therefore, there was not a desire to go and have uh, a sequel to, to Bare Knuckle. But, you know, we wanted Streets of Rage and, in fact, needed it as, you know, a additional title um, alongside uh, Sonic for Christmas 91 sales. And, you know, I looked back, um, I found an old floppy disk of files, uh, and it was faxes that I sent back and forth between SOA and SOJ, pleading, asking, showing why it was important, showing the volume that we could go and do on it, which was large volumes. And, you know, it was probably three months of back and forth with the head of consumer products for SOJ, where it was finally agreed to that, yes, they would go and make a Streets of Rage 2. And the rest is history. Thank uh, you, Al. Thank it, you. Yeah. It, it almost never <laughs> happened. Uh, you know, one day I need to go in and, you know, donate those floppy disks to the Strong Museum in Rochester yeah. well, so that it can be part of that. But it's just kind of like, and, and Tom, you'd love it because it's going back and forth. And it's like, no, no, uh, we don't have a team. We don't have anybody that's not going to do it. It's kind of like, well, how many, you know, can go and afford to go and, and lose this amount of volume? Yeah, thank um, God you persevered. And that's just counting what's there. Crazy. We need it because it was the only, you know, there were people who loved Sonic. There were people who wanted a fighting game. And Streets of Rage fit in there. Just like, you know, we were talking about how uh, we put in, we placed Altered Beast with Sonic. And that became a great one. Well, we did another special pack, I believe it was the year afterwards, where uh, Streets of Rage was in place so if you were in a retail store and you know and you know, wanted to buy a genesis system you know nah, i don't want to buy sonic but streets of rage i'll buy that and so you know it was just going in and meeting the needs of different types of customers um and what a great game we got out of that oh, yeah. um, yeah. you know yeah, sonic yeah. 2 and the streets of rage 2 what great sequels yeah. Especially when yeah. sometimes sequels, you know, whether it's a video game or a movie, just doesn't work. And the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 movie, what a great movie sequel. Yeah. So it's there. Um, you were asking about the other things. I have, um, I played the Genesis Mini 1. I have not, I don't have a Mini 2. Uh, but I've seen the, the um, titles that they put on it. And, you know, I think there's a, a very good selection of games that were on there. Uh, I may have made some different choices replacing this with that. But overall, I think it's, it's a, a good version. Uh, you know, and, and um, I think that the, the new Sonic games that they're coming out with, uh, you know, uh, trying to bring the excitement back. Uh, and consumers are responding very well um both in terms of talking about it and they seem to be selling well yeah, uh, yeah. so i hear frontiers is doing stuff. very well it, it has it's it's, it has, it's done very well just past three million units which was the biggest for a for an entry in a franchise so hopefully hopefully he's getting back to the highs though probably won't hit quite hit the highs that he got at in during your days but but tom al thank you so much for your, for your time this evening it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you both Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for joining us again and well, uh, enjoy the rest of your day well hope you enjoyed that because i'm pretty sure that we did didn't you mate brilliant absolutely brilliant i think it doesn't take much just to kind of let them go off and, and chat on their own so 
very little prompting needed, uh, but we did manage to get a couple of wee nuggets in there that I don't think either of us have heard before. So, no, absolutely brilliant, mate. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, it just felt like speaking to uh, a couple of mates. You know, you can tell that they they're still firm friends. Uh, so fantastic stuff. So, viewers, listeners, please uh, let us know what you think. If you're watching on YouTube, please drop us uh, a comment. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, if you'd want to get in touch with us on Twitter, you can get to, to me. My Twitter handle is swooper underscore D. You can catch James at the Sagaholic. You can catch the account at Sega Guys. Until next time, stay retro and we will see you on the Sega side. <laughs>